Hello and welcome to Castle of Horror, the show dedicated to horror movies and awesomeness. This week, we continue our Ed Wood retrospective with the 1955 film Bride of the Monster. From Denver, Colorado, I'm your host, Jason Henderson, publisher at Castle Bridge Media. With me from Austin is Tony Sabaggio, tech director at Rooster Teeth, lead singer and bassist the band Desert Samaras, and lead guitarist of the band Rise from Fire. Say hello, Tony. Howdy. Howdy. Also in Austin, Mr. Drew Edwards is the writer-creator of the long-running underground comic Halloween Man, currently published by Comixology. He is a Ringo nominee, Austin Chronicle Best of Austin Award winner, and a member of the Pen America Fellowship. Hello, Mr. Drew. Home? I have no home. I have no home. And finally, in Denver, at home, actually right upstairs for me <laughs> right now, color commentary from Julia Guzman of Guzman Immigration of Denver. Say hello. Hello, everyone. Hello. All right. Bride of the Monster, which was filmed as Bride of the Atom, is a 1955 American science fiction horror film directed, written, and produced by Edward D. Wood Jr., whom we just call Ed Wood, and starring Bella Lugosi, Tor Johnson, uh, Tony McCoy, and Loretta King. The film is considered to have Wood's biggest budget, about 70 grand. Production started in 1953. It wasn't completed until 55 because they ran out of money at one point. Uh, it was released on a double bill with a film called Makumba, and it has a sequel, which I believe we're going to be doing next. Bride of the Monster uh, I saw this first like 20 years ago. This is episode 312 of the Castle of Horror. Welcome, everybody. Let's get some opening thoughts. Um, let's go Drew, Julia, Tony, and then I'll go Drew. Opening thoughts, Ride of the Monster. So um, I had a poster for this movie for years before actually seeing it uh, that I had I, I bought in Fort Worth at one point when I when I still lived in my hometown and I, it, it, I didn't actually see this movie until after I graduated from high school because it you just it wasn't something that was as readily available as as plan 9 for outer space for for whatever reason um even with the Tim Burton uh Ed Wood movie um I remember the first time because as I mentioned last week I I I, uh, I am a big Bela Lugosi fan so I when I was finally able to see it uh, I, a friend of mine when I moved to Dallas actually had it on laser disc of all things and we went over to her house and we all watched it and I I remember being kind of appalled at how bad I thought this was the first time I watched it um and I I've only seen it one other time since then um so when i i i started to watch it this time and i don't know if it's just because we just did plan nine i i don't know like if it's just the mood that i i'm in i didn't think this was actually that bad i dare i say i actually think that this was reasonably competently made i i don't there's some stilted acting uh, mostly from the younger members of the cast. I think, uh, you know, Lugosi and most of the older, you know, character actors in this movie do pretty well. Um, there's some sets that look bogus. There's some special effects that look bogus. But I wouldn't actually say it's that much worse than, um, you know, a lot of other Poverty Row horror films that Lugosi appeared in, uh, you know, like The Devil Bat or something. I... I maybe i'm being overly kind i don't know but uh i kind of dug watching this this time i had kind of a turnaround on it i enjoyed it i think um lugosi is is fun in this for the most part and you know tor johnson still makes for a good zombie hench person and you know i again just this kind of a black and white 50s b movie i i didn't really you know, I, I, people might go, Drew, what the hell are you thinking? But I had kind of a turnaround. I think that this is actually kind of a competent movie so far as Ed Wood is concerned. I, I didn't really think it was noticeably more terrible than a lot of other uh, B movies that I've watched. And it's certainly more coherent than Plan 9. So, yeah. uh, you know, take that what you will. Well, the interesting thing, of course, is that we're going backwards in time because we just watched... Uh, Plan 9 from Outer Space, which is 1959. This one's 1955. Uh, and and in many ways, yeah, it is very different. And you could argue better, worse, or somewhere in there. Julia, uh, Bride of the Monster, 
Do you remember having seen this before? I don't. Um, I have watched, um, you know, Ed Wood, the movie, and uh, and that's what I think of when I think of this. So I actually went back and watched Ed Wood um, twice. I watched it once last week and again today just to, to remind myself uh, and to see and then, you know, reading about it to see what what's uh, what's dramatic license and what's not. So it's really interesting to kind of see what was going on in the background according to that film and then just read about it a little bit. Um, I agree with Drew that it is um, a good, a much better film than, than I thought, you know, or than I would expecting it to be or whatever it was. Um, I think it's a good performance of, um, of Bella. I really do. I think it's great. It's really interesting and, uh, and weird, you know, but like, there's a lot of like strange faces that he makes, but it's fun. It's, it's, it's entertaining. It's like definitely not a boring, a boring picture. So the only thing is I get so distracted distracted by the whole octopus thing and we'll talk about that but mm-hmm. oh god that just distra- i just was like kept wanting to throw things at the screen like why are you doing this to me because there's just so many different ways that they could have done a better job with this quote-unquote monster even just referring to it as a an enhanced octopus you know or something whatever like yeah. acknowledging that it's a freaking octopus i don't know that's just whole thing really i know you hate this phrase jason so apologies but it really took me out of the picture you know i, I just was like oh my gosh but um but yeah i think there's some neat performances and it's an interesting story um that this is bella lugosi's last speaking part and all the stuff that he was you know suffering um as he was making it so anyway i'm, I'm excited to talk about it excellent tony what about you what are you thinking um yeah i i think i'd first seen it on mystery science theater to be honest with you Mm -hmm. um but i've seen it since then and you know rewatching it this time um there's a lot worse b-movie pictures of this era yeah um and i'm always struck like even some of the like okay we're gonna be struggling with an octopus that kind of stuff there's way worse and it's Mm -hmm. kind of funny that we talk so much about you know people seem to react to the kind of like outsider art and kind of plan nine being bad or or maligned this you would be if you tried to argue that with this i think you would have a hard time proving your case um this is actually done really well you can tell it's a way bigger budget yes and it looks really good like black and white looks really great um there's interesting stuff going on it's got a i mean the plot gets a little murky (laughs) <laughs> with exactly what he's trying to do and how he's trying to do it but uh seeing Lugosi kind of bring a little bit of hypnotist Dracula back in and yeah. you know some there's some really good monologues uh I think his character really works um you know Tor Johnson gets to stomp around and be the Tor Johnson we kind of see <laughs> a lot like and it I think it all works overall I I've seen you know again I seek out a lot of just What's this? Oh, I'll put that on right now. Mm-hmm. Um, it's certainly better than tons of serials that were done around this time. Oh, yeah. As far as acting and the the sets. And, and I love that stuff. Like seeing a fake tank trundle around and pseudo Flash Gordon like stuff, you know, all the Flash sure. Gordon ripoff serials and stuff like that. Like those effects don't look always look super great by what i think most people would compare them to they work for me i don't care but right i think there's a lot of great stuff i was i was surprised yet again at this is just a solid mon- b monster movie from the time if yeah i i know that to some people it's better or worse you know like people think of an edward picture basically because of you know certain preconceptions right and if you you should never do that but if you took his name off of it and said this is just this this b movie you know monster movie from the time yeah uh i you wouldn't even i don't think you would even have those conceptions um you mean like again it's not knocking and it gets weird it gets weird when we say that like again i'm not saying that he oh he made all these bad movies or i I think you understand but there's a certain expectation that people have and it's also because of the the movie and kind of and the you know infamy of plan nine mm-hmm. but uh, i really like this movie um i think it works really well that's th- thank you very much and i think that that was well said i think that um it's interesting to imagine this this exercise where you present this movie as being just something on a double bill with a late stage bowery boys movie and or with with a, a 1955 movie like the ghost of dragstrip hollow or something and I think other than the real preposterousness of the octopus, yeah. uh, everything else, yeah, it, it, you know, there are a few flat actors, but again, if you look at like Ghost of Dragstrip Hollow or, or 
any of the Bowery Boys, it's the same thing. Your secondary actors will be often, you know, I mean, any, not exactly. Any, yeah, pick a B monster movie. Yes, <laughs> and there's a reason why they're B movies. Right, um, it doesn't make <laughs> them know, enjoyable. I think some of the perception also is, you know, if you say B movie from the fifties, for some pe- reason, people will be like, Oh, creature from the black lagoon. And you're like, no, that was a movie from a big studio that yeah, had a lot of right. money pumped into right, it. Right. 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 You know, like that was the Jurassic park of its, of its time. You're right. People don't you know. know. <laughs> yeah. Right. But like this, that's, that's this true. is a, a real tried and true B movie. And I think it's there's some plot holes, you know, yeah. to be sure. But you know, like there's bigger budget movies that have those same problems. And um, <laughs> I mean, there's some really big budget movies that have way more problems. Yeah, and yeah, there's have you seen Die Hard, Die Hard Two recently. They oh man, I love Die Hard Two. I know <laughs> it's not cool. I know it's not cool to like Die Hard Two. In I love oh, no, 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 I no love doubt about it. I love it. <laughs> I hey, at it. least Die Hard 2 had the decency to still set the damn thing at Christmas. Yes. All right? I'm just saying, they did it, I they, love... They, they... Yeah, huh? go ahead. I'm sorry. No, no, no. What were you going to say? I love Die Hard 2 very much, but they crash a whole plane for reasons that all of the characters agree on that are completely made up and make no sense. And that's okay. <laughs> I'm just saying that that you don't have to be in a cheap <laughs> movie to have plot points that make no sense. It's, it's you know... Well, this movie at least gives you like weird like for its plot holes this movie at least gives you weirdness in return and there's like a <laughs> lot of, there's a lot of like kinkiness and that like like you really see like you know Ed, Ed Wood had some notorious um fetishes that really play into this movie and mm-hmm. I like seeing that kind of thing like if you know something about a filmmaker <clears throat> like I, I I you know I I enjoy I don't know what that says about me but I know I agree if, I, I agree I enjoy seeing a filmmaker's hang-ups le- leak into his art sure uh Although, i got a question I before we... without seeing more feet from a certain <laughs> filmmaker yeah that would be fine never, we never, had enough it's... it's fine but uh yeah i much prefer ed wood's level to i've be never honest. understood you know that I, I if it were a fetish that really grossed me out that i guess i could understand but these are all so sort of sort of no. Just no, but I'm with Tony. No, no, no. I'm with Tony. I could not that um uh, uh once upon a time in Hollywood. <laughs> I was going nuts watching that movie. No. I was like, oh my god, stop with the damn feet already. I dude. think it's, I think that was strolling as well a little bit. That's but yeah, I I prefer yes. in over a breadth of work. I think I especially in this movie. And I've seen some rougher Ed Ed Wood stuff that is not really my bag. Right. It's cool and historical. And I think it's fascinating uh, to see his creative process and to to know what he made, right? But yeah. I've seen movies that weren't my thing, and but were but I'm glad I saw them, you know, kind of historically and yeah. presented, um, even on a big screen. But yeah, this level of stuff is all like this kind of '50s, you know. I don't know. It's no, I I don't think it's any different than any kind of Betty Page, anything that people did, you know. So. So before we get into into the plot, which I uh, which I want to, I just wanted to make one more comment, which is everybody says that this does play like a Poverty Row picture, um, and the Poverty Row era was going out at about this time. And I don't know anything about the Poverty Row scene. So Drew, I'm hoping that maybe you can help us out. I'm springing this question on you. If if you if you don't have an answer for it, it's fine. But like when somebody says, "Oh yeah, the Poverty Row horrors." What what is that? Uh I think a really good example also starring Bella Lugosi would be The Devil Bat, which mm. uh, uh yeah. you know the, the the Poverty Road is you know it's monogram, it's republic. It's it's these movies studios that were small, they they didn't have a, you know very much money at all um and a lot of the times their stars were people like bella lugosi who had kind of fallen out of favor mm. with the big studios which is why bella lugosi is in a lot of poverty row horror films uh and some of them are really fun and interesting like like there's uh one that i particularly like which is one called the ape man mm. and it's basically a wolfman ripoff but what bella lugosi is is a a quote-unquote were gorilla Mm. um 
Oh, yeah. But they have kind of a certain look and a certain sensibility behind them that, that they were they were trying to capitalize on the popularity of, um, you know, bigger budget studio movies. So, you know, what, kind of similar to, to what we would call a mockbuster these days. Mm-hmm. Uh, okay. Only I feel like the Poverty Row movies had a lot more imagination and ingenuity. They weren't just going to be like, okay, we're going to, you know, oh, they're doing Creature from the Black Lagoon. We're going to do Beast from the the Swamp or something like that. They, you know, they would, they would, they would, I think the scripts are a lot more interesting, but mm-hmm. they certainly, and you see this a lot in this movie, they were trying to capitalize on like the universal horror movies, which of course were, you know, more famous. And at this time getting a second life on television. Okay. And I, I think that's why a lot of people compare this to is because there is an attempt to really recreate the atmosphere of a universal horror, although on a fraction of the budget. So would Return of the Vampire count as one of those or is that the return of vampire is poverty row yeah i i I, you know it's it's a man alive i thought that was a creative wonderful yeah it's a nice made one i want to say kudos to drew for pulling that answer out of the air with jason through that just throwing that question on you that was really well done you're like definitely the expert you're definitely (laughs) the expert it's what i do that is amazing yeah by the way the idea I would love to see a modern were ape. If a werewolf <laughs> is that scary compared to a wolf, a were ape has <laughs> just got to be insane. Like if done right, that would be already. It's kind of terrifying when you think Great if idea. you think about it. But holy cow! If you go with the idea that a, a werewolf is a you know more menacing, monstrous. Imagine a more menacing and monstrous ape. That's terrifying. That's like well beyond Rue Morgue anything. That's oh man, of, I yeah. would love to. I would, I would pay to see that movie. Good. Where Ape. I guess that Maybe goes on the slate. Do, anyway. We should do a, we should do a, a set of uh, Poverty Row horror films at some point. That I agree. Fun. Well, I mean. I'm down I, with that. Very soon. First of all, in the book that we're doing, I think we should include, you know, something like a top 10 among, first of all, proposed productions that, that, Tony and Drew have just simply come up with Avatar, you know, Fire yeah, Shark, like, whatever. <laughs> including now the, the yeah, Fire Shark, <laughs> Where Ape movie. Uh, but uh, but yeah, no, we're going to be doing 30s horror. So maybe after, maybe soon enough, we'll do some uh, some Poverty Row. I think it's a good idea. What's going on in this movie? I saw a lot of what we we just saw in Kiss Me Deadly from our Hangout episode a few weeks back in this movie in that it's got this sort of cold war or or, or you know after world war ii like mm. mis- mistrust of of old europe and they're yes. they're up to they're up to Absolutely. no good and you know we they never really say where dr varnoff is from we just know yeah. he's from somewhere over there he's got an accent someone with another accent comes looking for him and yes. he's supposed to be <laughs> creating a quote master race. Uh, well, and we don't even know that well, yet. We know that that Vornoff, who is Lugosi, and he shows up super at the beginning because some we know he's up to no good because some hunters wander by his place and he has Tor Johnson dispatch them by dragging one back to his lab to do some, do some experiments and throwing another to a monster. And we'll pick that apart in just a second. But yes, Vornoff. First, has okay. Bought, so to be fair. First yeah. he tells them go away. First he okay. tells them go away, and then they're like, "No, it's raining cats and dogs out here. We have a gun. You're going to let us in." So yeah. then he does that. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure. Well, yeah, there, it's right like a crazy storm. Like it, yeah. it yes. looks hurricane style. And well, he's yeah, like, "No, nah, I'm not letting you in." Days worth of horrible storms. I love and, the the house when when these oh, yeah. in this early setup scene. And by the way, you know, if I were trying to set up a whole story early on, this is a scene that works pretty well because you have a couple guys stumble into a scary situation. We introduce your bad guy before we get to the good guys. And all that's all good, you know. So we have these hunters. They're in a storm. Big scary mansion. I don't know if this mansion that we're looking at is a model. I think it might be a model. You know, if you look it up online, nobody agrees on what it is. Like some people right. say, oh yeah, it's a matte painting. Some say it's a model. Some say it's a real house that's been superimposed. You know, I, I think it's a model. And I say that because it appears to glow from inside. So, you know, yeah, I, I don't know. Lit. 
some it's lit it looks to me it looks lit like you would light a miniature right mm-hmm. like it looks yeah. like a model in the way and it's it magical is. you know yeah. when when wood could nail these 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 effects that he was going for there would be something kind of magical about how how unreal something was it's a mm-hmm. ni- it's a neat looking house uh so and then when when these hunters go to that house uh he, you know Dr. Voronov, who's there, who, again, as, as you mentioned, Drew, is from an unnamed foreign country. He's in our country. He Which has apparently has of, several accents, not just one. Well, bought one of, uh, well, I'm talking about Bell Lugosi. He has bought oh. one of our dilapidated mansions, and he's doing atomic experiments under our very noses. <laughs> it's, um, it's like he was going to be part of Operation Paperclip, but then they're yes. like, well, can we have him do rock? It's like, dude, he wants to make creatures. Right, he <laughs> really wants octopi. I, I how does can it fit an Operation Paperclip? Well, I, I don't know. Everybody's real creeped out. Like we want him here. Just, just make sure he doesn't show up around the base. And That's they the kind of lost track of him. him. And yeah, they lost he's... track of him. <laughs> and it, he it, got to go do what he was. You know, he made off with some atomic material, and then yeah, it's a, it just feels like yeah, we got him over here, and then have you met the guy? And then they lose him. Yeah, exactly. And then they lost him. I he he probably actually just erased all their their minds with his Dracula hypnosis. Oh, that's possible <laughs> too. I mean, yeah. But I just get the impression that it seemed cool at once, and then they really, you know, he hypnotized half of them, and the others were just. Like, Whoa, that guy's no. Yeah. I don't think that fits in with our what we had hoped. And then he just hey, he off. made a Loch Ness monster. All right, Show that's true. Right. That's true. I want to. We so, Vornoff tells us they go, us, over, they okay. go over which lake that actually ended up in because there's your other sequel. Yeah, but the like. Oh man, I know, I know, I do. I probably shouldn't do this. I don't know if people enjoy this or not. But can you imagine? You know the way the Friday the Thirteenth series is, where it's just kind of that in name only. But if you had a Kolchak kind of guy who just had to track down all of Vornoff's like yes leftovers. Yes. <laughs> I would watch that series too. Like, oh no, you made a monster, were... and then over here he made an atomic robot, and then you just you just track where Vornoff went once he got to the if, states. If there were like figured, a Eastern European great. or or you know we don't know if he's a Nazi or if he's a what, but whatever he's mm, whatever he is, kinda... he's an expatriate mm. and. Mm. You know, if he I goes mean, around he's making, either, he's either a Nazi or a dirty communist. It's yeah, like, he's, totally he's, unclear. Yes, they really. Although they, I mean, they, they. I think also probably at this time you don't want to say too much of that, but right. They, I mean, it's pretty there. <laughs> like, yeah, he's, wants because to say he's referring it, to like, he wants mm-hmm. to make a master race. Right. But what's weird is, yeah, your, your reference to paper to a paperclip makes total sense. That you know, we got all these scientists out and said, you know, if you come to the United States, we'll hook you up and we'll give you money and you'll help us with Project Manhattan and all this other groovy stuff. And you know, he could be one of those guys who, as you mentioned, appears to have slipped the grasp of the American government. So we don't know how right. he got under what auspices, what amazing Julia Guzman kind of attorney helped him resettle successfully in the United States. <laughs> but that's since what Julia that time, does? Does she, does she resettle mad scientists? <laughs> shh, shh, shh. Talk about that. <laughs> Drew, we're going to have to, that. we're going to have to, you got to turn on your camera so she can eye. Hypnotize you and erase that. We get to, if we're in a room together, I can kick you under the table. Yeah, turn, <laughs> on, turn on your camera so she can. Right. Uh, I hypno you out of thinking about that. Right. No, but but uh, it, it is it is funny because what's really going on, Doctor Vornoff, Bell Lugosi, he's doing his experiments, which means he's murdering people around the lake to make them disappear, or he's feeding them to one of his experiments, or he's trying to make more monsters. He's doing all of those things, depending, and it's making a lot of people around the lake disappear. And meanwhile, a major plot besides our heroes who are investigating what's going on around this lake, you have a professor from the old country who's basically come to collect Lugosi. He's come to say, uh, you know, all is forgiven. Come home, be a genius in the home country. That's his plot. Um, what do you see? Just in a I, I, I have weird shit. 
<laughs> yeah. I have something. One of the plot holes that's that I mentioned earlier does center around the professor. And mm. again, I, I point this out only because we're discussing the movie. Because I this this to me this is not any better or worse than I have seen. Like like I've seen Michael Bay movies, which have billion you know millions of dollars pumped into them that's that my are point. very successful yeah. that have plot holes that are not dissimilar to this. Yeah. So the professor goes and he talks to the police with this whole thing of like, oh, I'm a monster hunter. I want to help out your expedition. Mm -hmm. And they're like, okay, tomorrow you can come down to the swamp with us. We'll we'll show you around. And then he goes down there completely independent of the police. Like, so he didn't actually need to, to come up with this whole cover story at all if he was just going to go rogue. Because he goes by himself. Yeah. 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 What's the point of all that? I I took it as, uh, I don't think the police are going to really... I don't like he thought the better of it. Not that it, it, not that it's not a hole in the way that you say it. But when I watched it, I took it more as, yeah, never. You know what? I'm just going to go down there. Well, what's weird about that, Tony, is that typically what that sounds like is the person writing the script, and we know who that is. But the person writing the script has this idea, and then when he gets to it, he goes, you know what? Actually, it's better if he just goes by himself, and you don't go, don't bother. To go back and fix the earlier scenes. Right. Yeah. Sure, so sure again, and, and knowing what we know about Ed Wood, that is exactly how stuff goes. You know, it's just like, ah, eh, nobody's going to notice. <laughs> you know, right. <laughs> fine. <laughs> if you, I mean, if you were writing it now, or if you're writing a series, you might have him go like get catch some flack from the police or have them at, start asking way more questions than he wants to answer. Right. Or even him just wake up, look at the time and go, why, wait, why do I even need them? And just decide to drive down. Yeah, there, some you know? awareness but, of the switch. But yeah. I mean, you know, I don't, none of that has, none of that has to happen for me in a fifties B movie in the way that Absolutely. this was in it. Yeah. Right. And I, I totally agree with Drew that it is kind of a plot hole, but you know, I was already just making that stuff up in my mind. So obviously, I mean, the shorthand work, to, right. It didn't detract from my enjoyment of it. It's just something I thought about like, it's mm-hmm. yeah, like, mm-hmm. you know, stuff like that isn't really what keeps me, keeps me from enjoying a movie. You sure. know, I especially not a movie like this, which, which I'm not really watching for, you know, the strong. I, I don't ex- go to an Ed Wood movie and expect the, you know, flawless writing. I go for it to an Ed Wood movie for certain, um, shall we say, uh, the Ed Woodness of it. And this movie delivers on that. Sure, sure. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, by the way, I, I have to say, uh, you know, from the good guys perspective at the at the cop station, you know, you have the lieutenant and, and Janet Lawton, who are this, again, this couple who are both investigating. It's actually, to, to you know, that's a completely, that's a completely Hollywood setup. It's groovy. And then their boss I is love, Harvey Dunn. I, I hmm? love him and his bird. Like the yes. whole business <laughs> with the parakeet. I, you know, I, I enjoyed that scene where she's, so he's sitting in the office with, um, the other guy and they're, and they're chatting. She marches in, um, and, uh, you know, she's, she comes over and, and apparently she's engaged to this cop guy. And, and so she says, you know, um, I don't know, you're on thin ice, buddy. Like basically you're in the doghouse. I think I'm going to, I think we're going to break up. I think, I don't think I want to marry you, whatever, whatever she says. And then I, what I love about that character is with, with the bird, he goes, okay, give him back his ring then. <laughs> And she's just yes. like, what? What do you say? And he goes, give him back the ring. You don't want to marry him? Give him back his ring. And she's just, just like, I'd rather throw it in the lake. You know, whatever. But I'm just like, that's classic. They, you know, and he's a that's... funny actor. Yes. The, this guy, his name's Harvey Dunn. I don't know this actor at all. I, I've probably seen him in stuff before. But he's very natural. He can take Edward's dialogue and make it sound like a human would say it, which is good. Well, you know, that's... that's what I can say for the other two actors in that scene. Sure. The whole, that whole business, though, of like, this is why I'm saying that this movie is is actually pretty well done especially when you think you know of of who made it you know the whole business of like here's this police chief with like uh you know whimsical bird you know that's like a quirky that's a quirky character trait that wouldn't you know uh that shows imagination when in the you know that and it's a it, it makes this character a little bit more lived in then. Isn't that interesting? So, it does show imagination. So I mean, it really something. is. Yeah. 
Edward going, hey, what, what would be interesting? That'd be kind of cool. I like the idea of this this police captain with a little bird, you know. So yeah. you just brought up something that, that really made me think, Drew. So if this had been the only Ed Wood movie mm. that we got a hold of, this is it. There's nothing else. He came. He made this B movie. This is it. Do you think you would say the same thing of, well, I wouldn't expect this from Ed Wood or this, like we talk around this a lot. And we talked about it with Plan 9 and the way it was received. But there's a lot of that kind of, hey, I didn't expect this from Ed Wood, or Ed Wood has mm. this, or I've seen this or that, and and kind of the flaws of some of those movies. But we all love this movie and agree that it's higher budget, that it works better, etc. So what is it do you think about other movies that make us have to ca- like? dance around that and go well you know who you didn't expect this or whatever to me that's like the more i think about it the more that seems you know a lot of big budget people have movies that that either bomb or don't do as well why do you think Ed you're, saying, particular... you're saying what is the true ed who is the true ed wood is it the crappy director or the director of this movie we're not even crappy but we're talking about you know like why why do we feel why do you think we feel the need to go mm. oh, i hadn't expected this or hey he's got this or that when well because we're, this we're is certainly by all means as good as any of its ilk from this time period. Okay, I think we don't say the same thing about other directors that have made movies as good or maybe slightly worse. Here's the thing. It's so easy to remember. Forget Plan 9. It's so easy to remember the end of this movie where clearly Wood ran out of money, didn't have the means to do the end of the movie. And so it is weirdly edited and mm-hmm. appears to have just given up. And it, and it doesn't, and, and you know, I'm skipping to the end, but that really is super strange and weird, right? And it, it's weird to juxtapose that with these earlier scenes in the police station and all that stuff that seem, you know, every bit of, that just seem like a regular old B movie. The, the, think, the distance is far. I know? think the question then becomes, if Ed Wood had had a lot of money, would he have been a good director? <laughs> I think you could hide your problems better with money. But the problem is one of Ed's major, major drawbacks that people talk about who worked with him was that he lacked patience. So Right. Well, he, that's what yeah, you see that a lot in in the Edward movie where he's just like cut and print. And they're like, wait a minute, you're just going to do the one take. He's like, it's fine. Yeah. But all of the, um, you know, all of the, 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 several of the tombstones in the graveyard, like fell over. Nobody will notice. It's fine. You know, he just, yeah. Right. So that's that whole idea of, I don't have time for, perfection. but it's circular because he may have been that way because he knew that he had made promises Everybody. to people and he only had like two days or something. That's what I'm saying. So, yeah. sure. so it's very difficult to tell, you know, it, like, um, would he have I been think, able though, to have? Yeah, go ahead. To, to Tony's point, I think when you can, you know, because we just did Plan Nine. Yeah. And that movie is as someone I don't remember which one of us said it, but someone said it. It's infamous, mm-hmm. and it's almost anti-publicity working that against anything else this guy might have done Mm -hmm. because ed wood you know because because plan nine from outer space is quote the worst movie ever made and he's proud Uh, of it It was something he was proud of so it was clearly what he thought of as his as his kind of thing you know his Mm -hmm. jam yeah, and I, you know, and look, I enjoy Plan 9 from Outer Space in the way that I enjoy Plan 9 from Outer Space, and we we spent a whole episode discussing that, um, but the, the largeness of that, the overwhelmingness of that is going to overshadow everything else this guy did as a filmmaker. And I'm not trying to say that, like, the, the guy was Spielberg or, you know, wh- whatever, you know, like, but as, like, a B-movie filmmaker, I, I, I think there was at least some sort of thought process going on here. And, you know, I think I said this last week, I have heard from people that, that, you know, that have said that actually, allegedly, his scripts read just fine. It was the mm. impl- implementation of trying to make them in the movies where they went awry. But I think if you look at this, um, I think maybe some of that was, you know, monetary. And I think some of it also might've been the patience thing, but he did have an aesthetic. He did have a style and, yes. you know, either you're, you, you almost have to look at these movies the same way you would look at any other Artur filmmaker 
only yeah. their their Z grade movies and say like do I like what is consi- the consistent themes and ideas across these movies? And mm-hmm. if the answer is no, well, then it's not for you. Yeah. But if the answer is yes, then yeah, you probably will find something redeemable about this. And, and I have to yeah, say, I'm by just... the way, I, I could watch this stuff all day. I love the world that, that Edward is describing here. It's pretty neat. And by I'm the way, just, I'm um, fascinated by... Like I said, the, my fascination, the reason for the question is to be compared to the least of your films as opposed mm. to the best of your films. But again, it's the least of your films, but that you're, pre- it is what you consider to be your best work. So it's not sure. that he's going, it's not like, let's say um, that you made a game one day because you had, you were broke, you needed money and you're like, I'm just going to, I'm going to work on this game. And it's a crappy game. And you're, well, the same could be said for so many actors who come on you know, talk shows and have to promote some horrible movie. You just tell they hate it. He, he loved this, that film. He was like, sure. he was so proud of it. So it's not, he's not being compared to some, you know, thing that he did because he needed a, a few bucks. Like, like in the same, you know, like Bella Lugosi, for example, if you were to judge Bella Lugosi's work by some of what he did for Ed Wood, but it, as opposed to by, you know, judge him according to Dra- uh, his work in Dracula or something like that, that would be unfair. But here I think it's he still is. Yeah. As we talked about in Plan 9. But I, what I, think, what I, I think it's super it funny is, much, but I, I just, I noticed our the trend in kind of going, oh well, this is better than X. So this really is, good point, yeah. And and I'm, I, that's what fascinates me because by all accounts, it's as good as many other films. And I, I. By the way, as we talk about that, weird. the money that he has, it, we should note that the reason he even had money for this is because the dad of Tony McCoy, who is cast <laughs> as the male lead, gave him fifty thousand dollars. Gave him the money really to fund the, the picture. <laughs> to fund uh, the pictures and, and yeah. if he would have his kid. Was, I mean, that's all. That's that's really what it's about, though. That's yeah. how you make. Oh yeah, it is. You know, I have I have oh, friends. Yeah. You know, I know people crowdfunding stuff now and. Sure. You know, you 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 got to be scrappy. You, I mean, at Fantastic Fest, you meet more than a few people who like. Well, so and so decided to pony up this money, and then we happen to know this other person, and you know, mm-hmm. magic can happen out of that. So yeah, absolutely. I and mean, I think actually, we're better off be... that, that that happened because we get this. Mm-hmm. Wood was creative in this endeavor. Let, let's you know, it's it, anyway. We shouldn't write off the fact that this guy managed to, outside of the studio system, fund a lot of movies in his life. That's yeah. pretty impressive, right. you know, that he still managed to do it. And and uh, that, but in in this film, in in Bride of the Monster, there's really only two things, and and we'll get, you know, we can get to them later. Like I, I mentioned one, which is the ending, and we'll get back to it. And the other is the monster. And I should say, so let's talk about this for just a moment. The nature of monsters in Bride of the Monster, which is Thank really you for saying monsters, plural. Because... There, are two, there are two monsters, so-called. One right. is a Swedish giant of a man named Tor Johnson, and yeah. the other is a rubber octopus. And it's so unfair that they refer to him as a monster when he's not made up to be a monster. He literally is just Tor Johnson <laughs> with a fake scar on his face. And I'm like, that is so rude. Um, <laughs> but the, and, the, and the script keeps calling him a monster. I know. We never bother to change that. Now, Michael Myers is a monster, right? Can we agree that Michael Myers is a monster? Michael Myers is effectively a monster, yes. All sure. right. Is Tor Johnson in this movie a monster? No, because he's, the, he he's, an, he's an Igor. Okay. Yeah, he done I agree completely. He's a, he's an Igor. Michael yeah, Myers in Cat in the Hat is also a monster. And the, and the only reason. <laughs> far more terrifying. Yes, the only reason exactly. that. Michael Myers is a monster is because he can't be killed, not because he was a bad guy. I think which, you put you put him in the, in the mask. He's a monster. <laughs> I'm not try, I've not tried to kill Michael Myers from Cat in the Hat, and nor would I, because I, I love him. Uh, yes. Um, yes. Uh, George, no, but, George Johnson, you know, is functionally kind of a, you know, he, he he's a, an evil servant. Um, he's, he's kind of, you know, both the Igor and the Frankenstein. Um, I don't think Tor Johnson would have a problem with being called the monster in this movie. Cause I'm sure he was paid to be a monster. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, I, I don't know. Um, he's, he's monstrous called- in his effectiveness at, at killing, uh, whoever Lugosi wants him to <laughs> yeah. straight oh, yeah. up murder, murder well, smash. He, like, he, lift, he lifts his arms up a lot. So I guess that's a monstrous yeah. thing. Yes. <laughs> he, he, he's cooler looking than the octopus, which is apparently an atomic 
atomically mutated octopus. Okay, so I want to talk about this because this is the thing that bugged me. So, all right, you have this idea. First of all, I'm dying to know how it even came to be that it was an octopus. Um, but anyway, he has this uh, notion that he wants to use an octopus as the monster. He has footage of an octopus in a tank, and then he has, or wherever it is, a real octopus. And then he has um, managed to get his hands on either by stealing or by renting. It's the, the, you know, it's not clear in the as, as, which, which, how it worked. But anyway, um, he somehow managed to get the, an octopus, a rubber octopus from um, what's it called? The Republic, Republic pictures. And it was used in the yeah. wake of the red witch. And he um, decides he's going to use this rubber octopus and also the footage of the real octopus, but never referred to either as an octopus. And I don't get why. And, and also, with the, according to the Ed Wood movie, which I don't know if this is true or not, there's supposed to be a motor that comes with the rubber octopus that moves its arms for it, the tentacles. But it doesn't, uh, they didn't get it. So I don't know if that's true. But anyway, um, I feel like you could have suggested the monster, called it a you know, an, a, an enhanced octopus said, you know, he's been experimenting with animals and now he's going to experiment with people to try to do this enhanced race. Um, and then had part of the, like, just kind of part of the, the rubber octopus at any given moment and not ever shown the stupid real octopus. Like, that was just so off-putting to me whenever we would see mm -hmm. that. I'd be like, that is not this, obviously not the same. You know, I did a, um, if, you'll, if you'll indulge me a, a quick story, I did a, um, a career day thing once at my daughter's elementary school and they, I, I chose um, to do, <laughs> I even, though I don't, even though I'm not a litigator, I chose to do like a little mock, mini mock trials for second graders. And so I had footage, my sister had filmed a short video of a squirrel eating my hammock um and uh -huh. it was like you know you just had this like the hammock just had holes in it and you and she filmed the squirrel and she's like i see you squirrely and so then we had a squirrel puppet and so i took the squirrel puppet to class to the classes and i said i have this video footage of a squirrel eating my hammock i would like one one of you guys to serve as my my lawyer and one of you guys to serve as the squirrel's lawyer and you're going to argue whether or not this squirrel needs to, you know, that the, whether or not this squirrel is the one who did it and et cetera. And then the rest of the class can be the jury. Well, I did this in two different classes. In one class, the little, the little boy says, obviously the squirrel did it. There's video footage. You can't just be, and he just starts like kind of hollering. <laughs> it's just, I, mean, I hope he becomes a lawyer. I really do. Um, and he was just like hollering about like this clearly is, and then in the class voted to, con to convict or whatever it was, to the, charge, voted against the squirrel. <laughs> okay. Then we go to the puppet squirrel. Then we go to the other class, and the little girl who's actually friends with my daughter um, is defending the squirrel, and she says in as, as calm a, play, a way as you could possibly do, and her father was a lawyer, by the way, um, hmm. she goes, the, the squirrel in the video is brown. The squirrel that we have here is gray. It is clearly not the same squirrel. That is not the squirrel. <laughs> <laughs> and so then the, the squirrel got off. And I was like, perfect example of a good lawyer. Anyway, that is what I found here is that the octopus in the tank is clearly not the octopus that is in the freaking rubber. <laughs> yeah. So it, it just really bothered me. I'm like, you could have done this so much cheaper uh, and not. It's been, and it could have been a much cooler effect, but that's um, that's all I'm gonna say about that. I so my if I had to guess, I think it goes. I need a monster. I have access to stock footage of an octopus. Yeah, that sounds like a good idea for a monster. Now I need to make the rest of that happen. You know, in yeah. a in a big budget picture, now it would probably look kind of like the Watcher in the Water from Lord of the Rings. Yeah. However, when you don't have access to that budget, you get the octopus without the motors because you know, again, if you go by the movie, hey, we got the octopus tentacles. Did you get the motors? <sighs> No, and you just make it work because that's what you have right now. Mm -hmm. And that's, and again, that's why, but this happens all the time. Like the stock footage doesn't match. I mean, you'll, you'll have stock footage. Think of how many ape suit movies there are. And there might yeah. be some ape, some real ape footage, but that ape does not look the same <laughs> when it's time to do inter any kind of interaction uh, right. in apes. Well, and very so, commonly stuff like, uh, sports cars, helicopters, you know, your heroes, you, you know, are in a helicopter and you might see like two, three different uh, helicopters 
in in various <laughs> insert shops. You know, that's but what I what gets me about that they're talking about is on the Black Dynamite uh, commentary. There's a section where there's a helicopter that magnet that has a magnet under it and pulls up a car and carries it, huh. and that was stock footage. And I'm like, who who made a reel of a helicopter with a magnet lifting up <laughs> a car? And like the fact that you could get that yeah. amazes me to no end. Like here, yeah. I have some stock footage of a. And then, hey, we're going to make that part of the funny part of this movie. That's amazing. I just, yes. I could not imagine coming through stock footage and finding that. Like, there's a reason why they should use it. <laughs> if you find comedy gold, if you find insane gold like that, you you better take that stock footage. Well, I think I said this when we were talking about Plan 9, but I, you know, for whatever deficiencies he might have had as a director, I actually think... Ed Wood was relatively good at editing stuff together because of what the way he did use stock footage in his movies is usually pretty creative. Oh, I mean, you yeah. only have to, I mean, the like it maybe it didn't work for Julia, and that's fine, but you're really trying to create. I mean, they went so far as to have him stare into a fake tank, yes, that is, you know, I guess a window to the lake. So there's there's thought going into it, and there's uh, you know setting the scene and building the set around that idea and everything like that. So while this, while it may be a disparity between the two, the the through line works as yeah. far as, you know, how he's going to present this. Maybe the tentacles and stuff didn't work as well. But, you know, again, you just got to, we got to get this done. And of course, he, you know, went over budget because why not? I guess. Right. But uh, yeah, I mean, that's part of the problem, right? You could have done it for a different budget and, you know, you could have had people just disappear into the water, that kind of thing. But that's not as well, monstrous right. or horror. That's not, as, that's not as horrific in when you're yeah. like, I want the horror. I want the people to see these tentacles grabbing somebody and then have a guy shoot at his friend. <laughs> like, which is crazy. I'll shoot these tentacles off of you, my friend. That that's I don't think that would work that well. Yeah, right. I mean, well, rifle, didn't have the you're like watching yet. it going, Oh, I wouldn't oh don't you know, hopefully he's shooting at the what like not at his friend, but it's just the way Well it's the gun the guns that, that they off. fire seem to have no effect on anyone ever. So I don't think mm-hmm. that it's a problem. Well, eventually the pistol <laughs> works. But Tor Johnson's like monstrous, so you know, you can mm-hmm. You can suspend disbelief a little bit there. Being I, I think, uh, electro atomized, though, that works pretty well because that poor guy who gets dispatched with the beginning, he goes quick. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the the uh, we should talk about these experiments. So Bella is doing this thing where he is kidnapping people and use and this is a very very common mad scientist trope. It's kidnapping people and using them as his latest subjects in his experiments. He is trying to make a larger, more powerful atomic Superman. He seems to have been able to accomplish this before once, which is with Tor himself. So presumably Tor is one of these atomic Superman that he's made. Um, He kidnaps one of the hunters. That actually didn't occur to me until you just said that. I'm guessing. (laughs) You're right. That makes perfect sense. I'm with Jason, though. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. Kidnaps one of the hunters. And he says, uh, I'm going to use you. We're maybe going to turn you into a Superman or you might die. Uh, either way, it's fine with me. And, and, and that's and that's when you establish that, that he is, he's a little, you know, he's gone bad for sure. I mean, you know, he says he wants to, what you know, why does he want to create an atomic race of Superman? It is very clear he wants to do it to become acknowledged as great. And that's it. So, you know, he's... Um, well, and, and, you know, take over the yeah. world. Take over the world. Right. Yeah, I was going to say, I'm sure there's a little bit of take over the world action going on there. That's true. That's That's really true. Uh, so anyway, uh, I'm, I'm trying to think how, how the story moves along. We have, we have his, uh, you know, the, the old country professor, uh, who, who's gone out there on his own. He shows up and he offers Lugosi a deal. He says, Hey, uh, for whatever reason you were either kicked out, run out, you defected, however it is you wound up in the United States. And yeah. for whatever reason this movie was made, so if there's a reason for any movie to exist, the reason for this movie to exist yeah. is the the monologue. The, the yes, s- absolutely. That, well, that t- tell us about that. Because Browski says... Uh, come home. Right. And by the way, that guy's hanging out here. Strauss, stop hanging out in the United States. Come home. 
and and yeah, uh, tell us about it, Drew. He's uh, tell us about Bella's. Legosi goes off on him about how like you know the thing I was riffing on during the intro, or he he has no home yeah. that you know he's he's been forsaken and you know no you know no one believed him and t- and now that they you know seen evidence of his his works all over the that he's these different places all over the world that he's perform these experiments it's creating monsters now they want him but you know that that, that uh but the you know his price you know like they offer him fame and fortunes but his price is much higher than that and yeah. it's 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 his last great speech yeah lugosi yeah. is awesome and like like in that you know that that one part like he really just comes alive and that's that's the lugosi of his his universal heyday right there well you know, it, like, it's not just that he comes alive but his pathos in you killed my family you killed my wife you killed my my child yeah. and just when he kind of sinks back into his chair and just the weight of all of this and just the audacity that someone would try to bring him back like yeah i you really like oh it takes this where were you when i had a family where were yeah. you when i had a place to be i tried to help you uh and in the you get the idea there's also the gravity of what he's done and what happened during the war what he would have been a part of had they mm-hmm. let him continue and all of that works really well yeah 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 it's it's awesome like it if you just had to pick one part that's definitely it well and i would i, I would actually say that the the in this one moment like if you were to say drew put together a a sizzle reel of what you think the best bella lugosi moments were like zero irony no joke mm-hmm. i would mm-hmm. put that speech in it absolutely well it's kind of like uh rain got to see uh dick dale on uh one of his last stints really on stage and uh, unfortunately, because our healthcare system is what it is, Dick Dale had to perform mm. way past his when he probably should have been on stage. Mm. And even though he enjoyed it, but she said, you know, he needed kind of help to get on stage. But as soon as she really? put a guitar in his hand, yeah, she it, she described it and said how much it blew her away that he like all of that shed away, uh-huh. and it was an amazing performance. I didn't get to go to California with her to see that, and I didn't get to, unfortunately didn't get to see him in Austin, which is a shame. But it's that kind of thing. Like we talk about this being his you know last speaking role. When you see Lagosi just really doing performing his craft mm-hmm. in this performance. Um, it's it's something else because it does go from like this heartened, I'm, you know, he's this mad scientist and he's selling that. And then again, when he goes into this chair and he just contemplates the gravity of everything yeah. and how, and also just the kind of sadness and rage at something that someone would try to patch things up. Like, we'll give you whatever you want. Oh, great. Now, you know, and yeah, I'm with I'm with Drew absolutely. Like seeing that, and ag- again juxtaposing it from Plan Nine, where you know a lot of things have happened, and you get you know he's walking and he's kind of being directed to you know throw up his cape and such like that. The difference between that those scenes and this monologue, yeah, is pretty amazing and telling, and definitely sells. You know, if anybody wants to. to say anything about oh well he was in this film or that film show them this and go okay what what do you have to say now (laughs) you know well in fact remember you know like we talk about we've done 300 on this show but you know you go through life you could probably just lift this monologue out of this movie in the same way that you could lift the dracula um you know, uh, across the Danube monologue out of Count Dracula, which everybody regards as not a good movie, but that's a good monologue, you know, and that happens a lot where these guys finally get something they can sink their teeth into, you know, just a few minutes of, of screen time where you can actually breathe and do well, and, 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 and do that thing. And Wood should really have thanked, I'm sure he probably did at times. And, you know, there's a lot of different accounts of what their relationship actually was like. Mm -hmm. um you know because you have the 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 version that tim burton peddled but that there's definitely people who will tell you that it wasn't quite that uh you know friendly sure um whatever reason why bella lugosi ended up with ed wood ed wood should thank his lucky stars that he had an actor of this caliber to be 
in yeah. this movie. <laughs> right. Because right. it adds an emotional resonance to it that it absolutely would not have had um, on the page. Yeah. None of the stuff, as good as some of the bits are, none of the stuff with the police is remotely as good as that part. <laughs> no. No. So... Uh, so, all right. So the, the, the guy from the old country is trying to, trying to get Ed, uh, trying to get Bella to come home and Bella says no and throws the guy to the octopus. Uh, and so then th- this movie's only an hour long, so there's not much left, which is to say that the cop has, has come, um, Dick has come looking for his fiance, Kath, uh, Miss Lawton, who has come and Bella has put Ms. Lawton into a bridal gown to do what I'm not completely certain. I think he's going to make her an, into another atomic Superman because he's going to keep trying with, with her uh, wedding dress on, which is just a bit of Ed Wood weird Gothic craziness. And well, it's, it's a meant to be evocative of the bride of Frankenstein. It sure is. Sure. Yes. And, yeah. and you know, also, also, you know, you have some of Ed Wood's kinkiness coming out there too. So, you yeah. know, it, it's, it's, it's all good stuff. Yes. No. And, uh, and it's at about that time that, uh, Tor Johnson Lobo decides that he's, he can't see what has happened to so many others happened to Ms. Lawton because also because he has her angora hat which which makes him feel close to her and so he decides to set her free and he turns on bella and puts bella through the procedure and i'm not making this up for the first time since tor johnson apparently bella's procedure actually works which is that tor goes over and he runs the machine and bella goes to get super strong and then you have a wrestling match between Bela Lugosi. You no, know, to Johnson. be honest, the fact that Tor has monster Tor, let's be clear, yes. has watched this procedure enough that he can actually go through all the stuff that yes, uh, the doctor you know, can do. I think that's fascinating. Oh yes, the laboratory set, even though it's not like quote unquote realistic, I love this laboratory. Set. Oh, me too. It's awesome. Yeah, like the the gadgets and then like the fake bricks and the background and like everything about like I I want this set in my house. Well, I mean, Just it also like has a window out. to the lake, like where you yeah. can watch his octopus. You think you think Monster Tour and is friends with the monster octopus or is it just too dangerous like they <laughs> are they comrades in their monsterdom I, like, I, I, he feeds it and they're just like yeah you know i get it i think <laughs> so i think that yeah i think they have a special um camaraderie um it, yeah uh, you guys are making me understand better what the whole monster idea is because i didn't when i watched it i didn't get that monster equals got strengthened by whatever methods uh Bela Lugosi was using and so now I get that that's what monster is so that's why Tor is a monster so the fact that they know he's a monster by looking at him is what's hard to get my to wrap my arms around but uh well, he's unusual he's a he's a weird looking guy if you saw but, him but no but, but I'm saying he really is a monster if the definition of monster is person who or person or the creature who has gone through this process that that uh, you know that um that the doctor has has uh, created you, you becoming an atomic superman although it seems like most of the people he puts it through just die well, right? they aren't so, as yes. tough as they aren't as tough as either a tor johnson or a octopus, octopus. or uh lugosi or, or lugosi right yeah, yeah. yeah lugosi becomes <laughs> giant he <gets> lugosi <laughs> he gets monster sized and he becomes exactly yeah like he, he gets bigger I, I, I kind uh, of he gets bigger. <laughs> That's because it's but not no, no, him. It's a stunt. It's like it's a stand-in. <laughs> no, but I think the no. idea is also you that you take this stand-in. from me, Julia. The ghosty grew three sizes. <laughs> no, but I well, love he says that you're going to be a giant. He got a bigger stand-in so that he gets I, bigger. That's awesome. I kind of wish that um, that we had, we had seen it work on Janet Lawton so we could get 1950s She-Hulk <laughs> running around. Yeah, sure. That's fantastic. I mean, you have to wait for like B girl for that. Yeah, this is yeah, the incredible. No, what is it? The fifty foot woman was it? The attack right. of the fifty foot woman. Uh, yeah, that one. Yeah. So, and that and that really does bring us to the end of the movie. Um, uh, and it happens fast because uh, Bella winds up on the mountainside. All the police are shooting at him, and uh, you know, in the end, he gets he gets knocked by a rolling boulder. 
that uh, that the detective pushes down. He gets knocked into the water and he gets destroyed by the by the. Yeah, octopus. I could have done without that whole last two scenes. Really, I mean, once once we've gotten, I, I wish that they had just wrapped the whole thing up in the lab because that whole boulder thing was so so lame. Yeah, no, it doesn't uh, it doesn't work. And like I say, this is the part where you can really just see Wood saying, "I just need to finish this thing, and I don't have what I need." You know, I I, I don't. I don't really have the inserts I, I need. I don't have all the scenes I need. I'm just going to have to, uh, you know, just do my best. Although and that, and that, that is a major problem. You can't prove that the boulder wasn't also monster sized. <laughs> <laughs> the boulder could have been one of the early experiments and there we're also using more of the doctor's monsters against him. Yes. Monster boulder. Monster boulder. <laughs> and 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 there's only that one like a good um like you know like a variation on the um the truck the uh, monster truck monster uh what do they call monster what do they call there the, are the such things as monster the, trucks. Yes. Monster truck rally? Yeah, whatever it's called. Yeah. Um, or, yeah, I think it'd be more like the movie Rubber, where the tire goes, like, kills everybody. Hmm. I think Monster Boulder feels like probably more like that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But again, we can't prove that it wasn't yeah. you know, full circle. Yeah. But yeah, no, it does end. It ends a lot like a serial, you know, going back to that. Yes. Hey, it's a boulder and a thing, and, you know, they all... And then there's an explosion. I think the explosion is because he is an atomic monster. And so when he explodes, oh, yeah, yeah, almost an well, atomic explosion. Ah, <laughs> but it bears out that if the, if the boulder is a monster, that it would explode that way. There you go. You know, according, to, according to the Tim Burton, Ed Wood movie, uh, the, the, the explosion just exists because the guy who gave them the money said there needed to be an explosion at the end. <laughs> oh, yes. I, I will argue that's... it's because the he meddled in God's domain. Ooh, tempered, I mean, that too. Tempered but, in there God's domain, yeah. tempered. but there, that's not the only uh, movie that's happened that way. There was something recently where I saw some commentary. They're like, oh, yeah, well, we... Why'd you do this explosion? What they said to some some executive mandated there's got to be X number of explosions. And I mean, they're if they're forking over the money, who are you to argue not? Yeah. Oh, I think we need less explosions. When is that ever? Plus, if you do have the money, you know when when is that? I mean, why can't we go get an edit of Gone with the Wind just full of explosions? Right. <laughs> My dinner with Andre explosion cut. Well, I mean, you, now we know that you could just do it with inserts. You know, you could have other actors playing the two guys in My Dinner with Andre, and then you cut back to Wallace Shawn looking shocked about something, and you just you just go, the audience will figure out how these go together. Kramer um, versus fire. <laughs> the, the explosion. Kramer versus, versus Kramer versus Boulder. Yes. <laughs> Kramer versus Boulder sounds great. <laughs> <laughs> Oh man, there's, uh, there's a cottage right. industry right there. There's a moment, Explosions by the way, in everywhere. Kramer versus Kramer, where uh, the kid falls and he busts his lip, right? And uh, Dustin Hoffman picks up the kid to take him to the emergency room because he's bleeding. His face is bleeding. And, and I, you may have knocked out a tooth. Huh? No, I'm just, I'm just <laughs> adding explosions to it. Right. And, he, and Dustin Hoffman runs for like four blocks. It's the most amazing thing. He picks up this kid. The kid's probably like you know, seven years old or something, you know, and runs with him. And the camera follows Dustin Hoffman, the actor, running like down all these city blocks to the emergency room. It's really, a, well, it's really, it's literally. What I'm movie. saying is if you've ever seen all of those action movie scenes where they're running from an explosion is roiling behind them. Yeah. This is prime fodder for Kramer versus fire or Kramer versus <laughs> Boulder. Oh, well, I mean, you could, you could put the Indiana Jones Boulder behind him. Yes, indeed. <laughs> Well, uh, so all right, let's get our final <laughs> thoughts. Sorry, I derailed it once again, but <laughs> in my my head can't stop absurdity. So my apologies to anybody who thinks in, that it's ever going to turn out differently. <laughs> I hope, I don't, I hope yeah. I don't disappoint you. Um, maybe that's what you tune into. I have no idea, but <laughs> I'm sure there's a subsection of people who go, oh, look, it's that time again. And then just hit the X button. <laughs> Only they sound and, hit, and hit the little X. Yes. Hit the little red X. <laughs> Here we go. Oh. Click and click. <laughs> so, all right, so uh, I can't remember what what order did we start? Start with Drew, and then me. We started with Drew, so it's Drew, Julia, Tony, and Jason. So, you know, I don't know. This one doesn't engender as strong feelings 
as Plan 9. So it's more difficult, but but there were some high points. And Drew, by the way, in this episode, you gave us a lecture on Poverty Row that could be clipped out and published as a Wikipedia article. So, <laughs> um, so that was really great. So, all right, final thoughts. Thank you. Bride of the Monster, you're quite welcome. <laughs> that was your Lugosi monologue for Poverty yeah. Row. Apparently. But, uh, don't when die. They do the, good job. When they do the Drew die. Sizzle reel. Yes. Um, all right. So, yeah, go um, ahead. you know, I don't think we talk nearly or at all about the Angora fetish in this movie, um, because it's not there's a lot, there's a lot of a lot of stroking of an Angora hat in, in this mm-hmm. movie, um, which I I thought was just terrific. You know, ha- clapped every time I saw that. Um, I really kind of liked this movie. I I was surprised. like, uh, uh, unironically, um, again, it's only the third time. I've watched it because I I kind of the first two times I kind of took a di- dismissive attitude and that was that was wrong of me. Um, but I'm older and wiser now, and I I've come mm. around to kind of digging uh, Bride of the Monster. I think that this is kind of unfairly maligned. I think it's a lot more competent than. Uh, plan nine would have you believe i think ed would if he had been a little bit more disciplined um well we actually might not have been talking about him because he probably would have been a more boring filmmaker but Mm. um there's something to be said to that but i i think um this this actually showed that he 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 had more going for him than just you know uh than just plan nine and i i will probably watch this uh more often now that i've i've seen it through these these fresher eyes so uh fun fun movie glad we talked about it wonderful thank you julia what are your final thoughts um, we watched it both with the MST commentary and then without because we felt like in this case, the MST commentary kind of made it so that we couldn't understand some of the dialogue and we thought was important here. But, uh, but I, I recommend it both ways because I do think the MST guys offer some just some delightful, uh, you know, jokes and, and, and points. Uh, our favorite thing to say um, is, uh, you know, to, from the MST is no one shall be seated during the exciting whatever scene, you know, whatever it is, like driving scene. And uh, in this case, it was no one shall be seated during the exciting water cooler scene. <laughs> right. <laughs> the, the, the boss, <laughs> the cop boss is getting his water. He's just kind of fiddling around the office and whatever. Anyway, um, I, uh, so I do think it's fun to watch it both ways, but for sure, if you, um, if you want to watch the MST version, do do at least watch it again without that at some point so you can hear especially Bella's um you know the the monologue that we we're talking about because that they do talk over some and it's it's worth hearing but um yeah it's a you know like I say there's some gr- some really fun things about it some things that I thought were great and then again like I said with plan nine there's some things that I feel like if they could have just done a few things differently it could have been so much better and not any more expensive um the monster and the, the whole scene at the end uh but you know you it is what it is. And um, yeah, I, I enjoyed, I enjoyed watching. I enjoyed talking about it. Wonderful. Thank you, Tony. What are your thoughts? Oh, I mean, I, I, like I said before, I don't think this is a worse movie than many, many mm-hmm. other movies of the time period and this kind of genre, atomic monster horror, uh, you know, mad scientist movie. There are way worse. And again, kind of going back to why, why we have, to say that is still a little strange to me in retrospect. Um, you know, I, I think it's it is what you're talking about, a lack of discipline. So you spend all the money and then you still have to end it, you know, with some discipline and with a little bit of extra cash. It could have, you know, been an even better movie. But I think what we got is um is really decent. It, mm-hmm. it holds up. It's got cool bits. You know, again, the monologue is fantastic. Um, I I think it shows uh, really what, you know, a lot of Wood's strengths in both ideas that are interesting, which, you know, that's give me a good idea and, you know, some some meat to it and some foundation and i'm gonna give something a lot of leeway yeah uh, but i don't think you even have to do that with this film um you know i stay up watching a lot of black and white you know even way schlockier stuff and i think this has a lot of great bits in it uh 
you know, still rough around the edges, but no, again, not more so than tons of other things. And I, I, I just really enjoy this movie. Um, mm-hmm. It's cool. It's cool to see Tor Johnson smashing, you know, hulking out and doing stuff. I think there's, there's just, again, maybe there are things that in retrospect, you might go, oh, this could be better. or That could be better. But taking it as a whole, I, I just really like the movie. Um, and I do, you know, I, I did catch it first with Mystery Science Theater just because I'd never been exposed to it. But yeah. I wish I had seen it on like a monster theater or, you know, similar kind of presentation first. Um, but I really enjoy it. I don't, um, I don't have Wonderful. a problem with any part of it. Um, well, and I think the thing that I really appreciated uh, from you, Tony, tonight was when you said we, there's this tendency for us to judge a film based on what we already know. In other words, uh, you, you know, it's that it's that confirmation bias that we talk about in everything else from software testing to whatever. You know, where you bring an attitude already and that can make you just see confirmation of the thesis that you already have. And we can do that here where where you know what you think about Ed Wood. And so but um, so it, it can be difficult to just walk into the movie and try to divorce yourself. I mean, if you did the Pepsi challenge on this and mm. several other movies that are similar, yeah. uh, I think you'd be hard pressed to say, you know, right. I mean, by the way, that Pepsi challenge probably also dates me. In a huge I just way. thought the same thing. I was like half of our audience going, what? <laughs> you can look it up. <laughs> yep. The Cola Wars. No, no less. Yep. Yeah, no, absolutely. What a strange time period. I was starting to say <laughs> stupid, but it's just that that's indicative of a time. Cola Wars, the Pepsi Challenge. Yeah. <laughs> Love it. <Jeez. clears throat> Pardon me. So, okay. Uh, I have I have nothing that I could add to that whatsoever other than that I, I really enjoyed talking about this. And, and the interesting thing is next week, we had been talking about doing one movie, but actually we're, we're going to go in a slightly different direction and we're going to do the sequel to this movie, which is called Night of the Ghouls. And here's the weird thing about that. I haven't seen it. Night of the Ghouls is a sequel to Bride of the Monster and uh, it was not released. That's what was most distinctive about it was that it, it, didn't, it didn't come out. It had a, pre, a, a, a previous screen and then uh, the creditors to Ed Wood, they owned the print, and so he never did release it in his lifetime. So we're going to watch that. Can't wait. Uh, so cool. So let's get endorsements. Whatever you are watching, listening to, whatever you want the world to be exposed to that you've seen. Uh, so Drew, let's start with you. What is happening? Uh, a, a lot of things this <clears throat> week I took in. Uh, first off, um, I, I want to give some... I, I spent some money on myself this week and I got uh, some Shout Factory uh, Blu-rays of um, some old Hammer movies, uh, one mm-hmm. of which was uh, The Devil Rides Out, which I haven't dug into yet, so I can't speak to that yet. But the other one was a movie that I've been trying to track down for a while now, which is The Embalmable Snowman. I can't talk right. <laughs> um, which is a a Yeti movie starring Peter Cushing, and it's it's weird because it's kind of a a Hammer before they had become what we think of as Hammer, oh, right? Yeah. Um, it's it's black and white. You know, it's set during what was then present day. Um, it's it, it's it's not anything like the vampire movies that that we associate with Hammer. But it, I've always thought it was like a cool sort of um, precursor of the thing and other more like somber horror movies that take place in a snowy environment. So it's cool. It's, you know, I've been watching the special features right now. I'm like about halfway through the commentary. And, you know, first of all, they've cleaned it up really good. It looks great um, because mm-hmm. for years I had a, a, VHS, a VHS version that I somehow misplaced. And that's that's all you could have. It's not you know it's not a, a widely popular Hammer movie, so I, I don't think it's even streaming anywhere. So it's nice seeing it all cleaned up like that. But it's also like the special features are insightful. Like I didn't realize it was a remake of a, a TV movie that's since the, a BBC TV movie that's been lost actually mm. and um it, i also didn't realize that it uh was written by the same guy uh, written that had written all the quatermass movies and everything and uh you know that stuff is just cool to learn so it's it's a good blu-ray and i think if you're interested in hammer and kind of seeing hammer starting to become hammer because it's a genre movie but not 
quite the hammer that we think of i think that this is an interesting movie so if you've never seen it and you you know i've I've intrigued you at all i i would suggest tracking it down um Another thing that I got into this week was a comic book from a a company called American Mythology Productions, uh, and it's called The Eternal Thirst of Dracula. Uh, And so, yeah, and it's set in 1975 in the Philippines, and it's about a group of B-movie makers who run afoul of Count Dracula. uh, And the the director of this B-movie to find out that he is the descendant of Van Helsing. Um, All of which is pretty typical hammer horror kind of stuff, but it's done on a much bigger scale because it's a comic book. And speaking of gorillas, this has (laughs) vampire gorillas in it. So nice. Uh yes. Um and they uh, look awesome. I had uh, a pitch written... for a vampire gorilla in a um in a every which way but loose. Uh <laughs> I had a, I had a horror every which way but loose uh knockoff and Clyde was also a vampire. Nice. Which I tried pitching but it hasn't stuck so that was sad, but I'm I'm always interested to see more of that because I think well, a vampire gorilla sounds. I mean, Clyde was an orangutan, of course, but uh, vampire simian sounds terrifying. They look pretty creepy. They have big bat wings and they so, sleep so upside like the down. flying monkeys in the in in the Wizard of Oz. Uh, it's, it's scarier than that. <laughs> yeah, um, awesome. I like. All- I like all the character designs in this. I, I think they did a good job. It's written by Mike Wolfer. It's, uh, it's got several different artists on it. So I, I'm for, I'm not, I, I apologize. I'm not going to list all the different artists who worked on this, but um, if you like hammer, I think that you would find a lot to like here. Um, finally, I, I I'm going to say like, you know, a few months back we did Jurassic park. <laughs> um, we just did planet of the dinosaurs. I am a dinosaur nut. Um, so uh, this last, Saturday, yesterday, I binged watched the Jurassic World animated show that they just put up on Netflix, uh, Jurassic World Camp Cretaceous. And I wasn't really expecting a whole lot from it. I was just going to watch it because I like stuff with dinosaurs in it yep. but th- when i first saw the, the the character designs for it i thought it was going to be probably too kitty because the character designs look kind of tip- with typical dreamworks entertainment character designs but man this thing is so good like it, like they did such a good job of like capturing the stuff that i like about the jurassic park movies hmm. and it's 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 actually so it's rated pg but they push that as far as they can go like like you actually have like people being like chased down and eaten by dinosaurs and things like that so wow (laughs) yes i wouldn't i wouldn't recommend it for for people who have kids that are like skittish Mm -hmm. or or can't handle that kind of thing but it is that sort of like if you have a kid that's kind of interested in horror or sci-fi i think this would be a good like training wills thing for that and it's it's it does it's it's interesting even how they chose to do it because it's like a side story of something that happened during like the jurassic world movie but i actually think you know the more i think about it i actually think i found the characters in this a little bit more endearing than the characters in jurassic world like i i liked this more than the movie that they were riffing on and as a dinosaur nut the main antagonistic dinosaur in this is a carnotaurus which is like one of the coolest looking dinosaurs that barely has anything in pop culture it's like this basically like it's it it's 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 um a big horned carnivorous dinosaur with these extremely diminutive arms so basically it looks like a giant snake on on legs with horns and it's the <laughs> coolest looking dinosaur that just, just like i don't know why hollywood doesn't do much more with it so it was cool to kind of see someone finally do something with this critter and something so if you like the jurassic park movies and you weren't going to give this animated show a chance like i i'm giving this a big thumbs up like i i this i was really pleasantly surprised by this i i think a lot of people probably wrote it off because unfortunately that the way the character designs look and the actual tone of the show are like two completely different things. And mm-hmm. I, I, I kind of wish that they had not done like that typical DreamWorks 
animation character design style i think that they should have gone something a little bit more um realistic or whatever because it, it just doesn't have that kind of tone to it yeah but man like i was really impressed by this so hmm. i i you know Lots of stuff I've taken in and enjoyed this week. It was a good week for pop culture with me. Wow. Well, thank you very much. That's that's fantastic. Uh, Julia, I don't know. Do you have anything to endorse? Oh, I have several things. Um, good, because I haven't first, asked you about it. Yeah. The first one is something I watched a long time ago, but because of events of this weekend, I think it's uh, – I'm, I'm going to go ahead and endorse it. Um, I uh, – you know, we lost – um, Justice Ruth Bader, Bader Ginsburg yesterday, which is just a devastating loss for so many of us um, who are so grateful for everything she did for for women and for families and for LGBTQ and for just rights of everybody. Um, an amazing human being. Um, so may her memory be a blessing. We uh, I, I, watched, I watched a while back um, on the on the basis of sex and it's just a, a really great movie about you know just one part of her her very uh illustrious career so i recommend that and um you know it's going to be a while before we see anybody like her ever again if ever um the other couple of things i have uh, that are much more um you know i wouldn't say I, one of them's not that upbeat but it's really you know it's definitely something to take your mind off of this and other events that are going on right now that are maybe hard for people to deal with um i uh love 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 the new netflix show away hmm. um starring hillary swank and josh charles it is a really diverse cast and a ver- diverse um uh you know, like the the the, uh, the the cast and the um, and the characters, the you know the people in it. Um, I, it has everything from um, wheelchair users to, and you know an actor who actually is a wheelchair user in real life, as well as Tr- Josh Charles is in a wheelchair for a part of it. Um, oh, spoiler, <laughs> sorry. Anyway, uh, and then you've got um, not only racial diversity, but but national cultural you know cultural diversity because these people are on this um this space uh the, there's not space station but it's like a um um it's not a shuttle you know it's just a whatever it's a it's a vehicle um they are from different countries so you've got people speaking chinese you've got you know you've got you've got people speaking uh russian all these different languages and you've got um you know, like a Latino character. It's just a really, really diverse, like the most diverse I've, I've seen. And I think I love that the, the main character is, um, is a, a woman commander, but the fact that she's a woman almost, I almost feel like they didn't write the character gendered. I think they wrote the character as a commander who has a spouse and has a child and they didn't really bother. I could be wrong about this, but it does not, there's nothing about it that ever feels like, oh, it's a woman. You know, it's just, it kind of, you know, there's definitely things she runs into because of being a woman. But for the most part, it just seems like it's just kind of an afterthought, which I think is great. So that's a fantastic show. It's well written. It's interesting. Every single episode is something happens that you're just like, oh my gosh, very suspenseful. Uh, great show. And then the other thing is just a, a fun thing that's been around now for, I think, um, uh, maybe two years. And I've just been getting into it a little bit is, is the podcast David, Ten- David Tennant um, does, what is it? David Tennant doesn't, I suddenly forgot the name of it. It's David Tennant does a podcast with, I think. Mm-hmm. Right. Anyway, um, it's just David Tennant interviewing people and it's so fun. It's, he's such a good interviewer and he, he's just great. I love his accent and he always has all these neat people on and they have great conversations. So that's just a fun thing. If you um, want uh, something to listen to. So basis of sex. On the basis uh, of sex, away, away, and, and David Tennant David does, does a podcast, podcast with. All right, excellent. Yeah, Tony, do you have anything for us? Yeah, I mean, I, I'll also second away. Um, Rain and I finished it last week, I think, and then switched over to Cobra Kai. Uh, we have a our in house name for that genre is fuck space because <laughs> ever since Gravity, <laughs> <laughs> there's two, there's two genres in there there's uh fuck space and fuck the ocean because any yeah. underwater thing is like hey look now some more stuff has gone wrong <laughs> sucks no to be you so <laughs> that's our in-house uh you know we'll end an episode and then just look at each other one of us will go <laughs> fuck, fuck space, space right <laughs> like yeah because you know when i was young when i was younger and i would visit houston um we would go to nasa probably every summer mm-hmm. and uh, i astronauts was so cool and then later on like watching these movies like ah i don't know 
Yeah. Like I, I have immense amount of respect and uh, admiration for the space program, what it brings us and, you know, the, everything. But yeah, fuck space. Well, I grew up, I grew up in Clear Lake. Um, oh, and that's, uh, I actually was, um, was classmates with um, the daughter of the pilot of Challenger. And so there's a, actually oh, wow. a new Challenger, a, a new Challenger documentary that I, I just watched, which is just, oh my God, I was sobbing from the first time. Yeah, I can't. Rain and I looked at that and yeah. just with everything, I, like I, I'm interested, but I couldn't like mm-hmm. that just. You know, and I again, I mean, if you grew up around there, you'll remember NASA for a, a long time, as long as I could remember until I came back, it was in the middle of fields. Like it was there was nothing around there yeah. until there was. And then it was like by the time I got back, it was like strip malls. Yeah. Had well, come, no, exactly. Come the, and house, gone, actually. the house that like, I grew up in and my parents still live there is like five minutes from the Johnson Space Center. And when oh, we yeah. when our house, when we moved into our house, everything around it didn't exist yet. Like we literally yeah. had uh, the the last house of the ones that had been built on the block and there was still houses being built across the street. Nothing else anywhere else. So, uh, yeah, I, I feel you. It was such but, a um, weird dichotomy going back and seeing because, like I said, not only had things been built but mm-hmm. they had built and then stagnated. Like it was like crappy strip mall now. Mm-hmm. And that was, that was weird because I hadn't gone in years, but uh, that I, I will say that I've also, I'll be honest with you. I, I don't know. It's been not the, my favorite week uh, for a lot of reasons. Um, there's been some positive stuff, but in general, I just haven't felt great. So I, but I did buy, I mean, all I've been doing is playing the new Mario trilogy that came <laughs> out for the, for the switch. So basically, games from 96, 2002, and I forgot when Mario Odyssey came out. I'm playing Mario Sunshine because I, I like that game. And then watching Cobra Kai, and then my comfort mood, my comfort food movies have been uh, Trick or Treat, 1986, again, mm. and Road Warrior. So I don't know. <laughs> this, I could watch Road Warrior an infinite amount of times, and the amount of times it came on cable uh, proves that I, I've probably come close by now. <laughs> What does he uh, say? It's like three days back. I saw a tanker. Yeah, and it's this great. It, it's no my it's so... my favorite. My favorite, Jason. Though when you're talking about what he says is when people talk about. Oh, I remember going to to you know. I remember going out to shows or going to burgers. I always hear that in the gyro captain voice when he's like reminiscing. <laughs> remember lingerie. <laughs> <laughs> this, this wistful lingerie <laughs> remember because it's such a and i love that line because it's something that just it is of a time when you don't have to worry about anything else right yeah like that is one of the and it's what i mean because he's kind of weird cat and so it kind of says something about what he thinks about but in retrospect it is one of those things that when you don't have to worry about a lot of other things, you can go buy lingerie and like, that's a cool thing. But the way he says it and the, his, the wistfulness in his voice that, and I, I like uh, when he realizes the gun doesn't have bullets. Slow. <laughs> when people do things, I, I just, I always reference that. There's, it's really it's wonderful. Actually, but... And like, he's such a great character, but, but those two lines, I, Every time somebody's reminiscing, like even if I read it, I hear it in the gyro captain wistful voice in my head. That's that and that's low. There's it's a it, it is wonderful storytelling. It, truly, truly a wonderful piece of storytelling, that movie. Yeah. yeah. I I even love the end when they're driving away and and, and he talks Beautiful. about how, how he grew up and oh it's wonderful. But it's it bookends just, and it just ah uh, there's so much yeah. awesome in that. Just the way it, yeah. I could but, watch, but like I said, I, I could watch that movie an infinite amount of times. What I was remembering was the line uh, Max goes, he says, two days ago I saw a vehicle that hauled that tanker. You want to get out of here, you talk to me. And it, it, it so elegantly like flips the movie into the next act. It's just like, mm-hmm, bink. Mm-hmm. And now, now we know what the next part of the movie is going to be about. It's so, it's perfect. Um, so, yeah. Uh I got nothing. Plus, humongous so is is one of the best. You know, yeah, gas the see what yes. you've made me do. <laughs> see, you know, if you if you just would give me what you want, I wouldn't have to have to quote unquote kill all these people and do yeah. and let my people do all these terrible things. Like, no, you have a choice, but it fits. You know, you, you see people do that all the time. Well, see yeah. what you've made me do. We didn't really make you tie people to the front of cars. Yeah. Well, you, you know. know. 
we didn't make you shoot people with uh, crossbows or set things on fire. But yet, <laughs> there that's where we're at. Ba-da-ba. Wow. Uh, gosh, I got I got nothing. I am looking forward to getting to Night of the Ghouls next week. I'm really thankful that you guys would spend would spend the evening talking about this. I love talking about Bride of the Monster. It was so fun. I hope if you're listening to this, if you're still listening to this, give it a watch, either with the MST3K or without. Thank you, everybody. Uh, we will we will talk to you guys soon. Bye. Night. Good night. 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 night.